ערב טוב לכולם, ברשותכם אני אעבור לשפה האנגלית שהיא הלינגווה פראקה של תקופתנו. Good evening everybody, my name is Gabriel Motzkin, I'm the director of the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute and it is my signal pressure to open this series of lectures. This is the initiative of Dr. Idolit Manovich who thought that even though we make a great deal of the fact that we're in the Levant primarily think in terms of the fact that we're at the edge of Europe, we think something about our neighbors, the Palestinians and the Arabs, and out of that we don't think at all. Now one of, oh yes, please do turn off your cell phones, that would be useful. Now one of the things that we live in a neighborhood where there are countries with rich and varied pasts with important presence, with important relations with Israel, and it's good to know about them and how they think. Now, I want to say one word about this theme. As you know, if you don't know, you should know, that Greece has been having a hard time for the last few years. We, people in the West, say, oh, that's because the Greeks don't want to cut their pensions. People in Greece don't think that at all. They think they've been persecuted by these stingy Germans. But there is one fact that people don't point out in all this, especially for a country that in my lifetime underwent a period of authoritarian rule in the uh, late 60s and early 70s, and that is throughout this great crisis, Greece has remained a democracy. I think that's an amazing fact because most countries subjected to what has happened to Greece in the last five years would not have remained democracy. They would have opted for some form of authoritarian rule. That happened all over Europe in the 20s and the 30s. That happened in Argentina several times. And it ha also has happened in Greece twice. First Metaxas and then the colonels. And yet in this crisis, none of that happened. So we have to think ourselves, what is the secret of the Greeks that despite this economic hardship, they have managed to hold on to this political system? I hope in the course of these lectures, of which this is one of a few, to be enlightened on this topic. It's a great pleasure that the ambassador of the Hellenic Republic in Israel will address us tonight. That's His Excellency, Mr. Spiridon Lampridis. Now, chairing this event is Dr. Janine Horowitz, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Haifa and the head of the university's program of Byzantine and modern Hellenic studies. Her research focuses on medieval mentalities in Europe and on the Byzantine Empire. So we are going to have a lot of Greek tonight. Unfortunately, I cannot let our lecturer speak in Greek much as I would like to. So I will, without further ado, I will ask Dr. Horowitz to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Motzkin, for your words and for your introduction. Uh, Professor Motzkin, head of the Van Leer uh, Institute, Your Excellency, Mr. Lambridis, uh, Ambassador of the Hellenic uh, Republic, Mrs. Anna Faru, uh, First Counselor, Mr. Yeni Matas, Consul, dear colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I would like first to extend my deepest thanks to Professor Motskin, to Dr. Ido Litmanovich, with whom I've been working these past months, and the Van Leer Institute for the opportunity to conduct and carry out this, this joint, joint venture of uh, lectures in cooperation with the Onassis Foundation within the program of Hellenic Studies in the University of Haifa, which I'm happy to say uh, was Byzantine and modern Hellenic and is today Hellenic Studies because it has uh, received also the right to uh, englobe uh, the uh, classical study, Greek uh, studies. So we are the, prog the program of Hellenic Studies all uh, comprising. That was just to, to, to say that I'm proud. <laughs> uh, 
So we embark today on this joint undertaking on the significant matter, as you just said, Professor Motskin, of Greece in the eye of European global uh, cyclone and give us a chance uh, to us and to the Israeli public in Jerusalem and in Haifa to sort out facts from misconceptions in this entangled web of economics, politics, and social consequences. To inaugurate this series of lectures, I'm extremely happy uh, to welcome this evening His Excellency, Mr. Lampedis, uh, both in his diplomatic capacity as ambassador of the Hellenic Republic to Israel and as a specialist in economics, in political science, and international relations. Mr. Lambridis has a rich and exciting diplomatic career. He served in diplomatic offices, to quote just a few, uh, in Skopje, Geneva, Bruxelles. He headed the Directorate uh, for NATO and the Western European Union. He was also very active in the organizing committee for the Olympic Games in 2004 when, among uh, other tasks, he was head of the International Torch Relay. And Mr. Lamprizis is no newcomer in Israel. It is his second term of office after the first one at the beginning of the 90s, which makes him almost uh, ben Bight, I know he knows enough to understand that. Uh, last but not least, I take the liberty to disclose another thing, uh, that besides his diplomatic responsibilities, there is another side uh, to the mirror. We are indeed faced with a well-known writer. Um, Mr. Lamprey, this is the author of three historical novels in, Greek, in Greece, published in Greece. I know one of them because I'm reading it all the time and all the time until I, I, I'll succeed in Greek to arrive uh, to the end, which I translate, uh, tell me if it's right, from within the old mirror. Through the old mirror. Through uh, the old mirror, hoping that sometime there will be a translation, if not in Hebrew, in English. I hope it too. Okay. So to return to our lecture, I recall a prophetic talk you gave two years ago, Mr. Ambassador, at the University of Haifa within the Onassis uh, Program of Hellenic Studies, in which you also, I can say, some of the present aspects of the global uh, European crisis. We are eager this evening to follow your insight of Greece in the midst of a Europe in transition and listen with expectation to your lecture on Greece and Europe at crossroads, an insight on current Greek politics in Europe and the East Mediterranean. Kyrie Presvi, Barakalo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Could I do it from here or you need me up there? Uh, there he can he, he, use this, he can use it here, okay. I think it's more uh, friendly and convivial if we do it in a way that we can uh, probably see each other eye to eye better. And uh, of course, first of all, I would like to, to thank uh, our audience, which is the most important element of our tonight's gathering. And as a matter of fact, being a Greek among Jews, uh, which both are characterized by infinite and unstoppable talking, I'm looking forward to a dialogue and not a monologue. Therefore, I will try to make myself as brief as possible in order to give time to you to address questions to all three of us and then perhaps uh, being able to respond. My special thanks, of course, go to the two professors that I already knew and the third one, Mr. Litmanovic, that I understand is the soul behind the organization of this. But I cannot forget, of course, apart from Professor Motskin, who everybody knows in Israel, also to mention the specific and very, very important role of Professor Horovitz, who I have the pleasure of having met a couple of years ago, and who since has become one of the central figures of Hellenism, as she puts it, of Greece in a, in a more general sense in Israel. So many, many thanks for the opportunity you are giving me to have a dialogue with our friends tonight on issues that seem to be uh, not disappearing from the screen of uh, of news, although my deep wish would be that one day 
I will wake up and I will feel, looking at the TV, as a Dutch, which means very dull, very bored, and very calm, which is not the case, either in my country or in this wonderful country. As you say in Israel, never a dull moment. Well, that saying, among other common things that we will discover tonight between Greece and Israel, is going perfectly well matching to the realities of Greece. Never a dull moment as we speak. So let me start from a, a more, let's say, um, down-to-earth point and state the obvious, which is, is easy for any, any orator to begin a lecture with, especially in our field. Well, we all know that uh, the world at large, the entire international scene, is going through a tumultuous time for some years now. It's not new. I would put the, the, the emphasis and the starting point of this new phase of international politics obviously at the immediate post-bipolar dates. And there's a, there's a meaning for that. There's a reason for doing that. We, especially the older ones, we remember very well what the world looked like before 1990, and we are witnessing day to day what the world is becoming after 1990. Of course, for the younger generation, we'll already start saying, that ones of you that are younger, well, the old man is starting telling us stories about 30 years ago. How are they relevant to what are we living today? Well, they are. They are in many ways, and we, which we, we will discover. And that is also very relevant to the Greek crisis, which is not only a Greek crisis, it's a European crisis, but not only a European crisis. I'm not going to, to take the responsibility out of Greece and throw it on someone else, as <laughs> Professor said, it's those bad Germans. It's not those bad Germans. It's much more complicated than that. I will try to make it as simple as possible. Now, the fall of the, of the wall in Berlin and the collapse of the Soviet Union did it, I mean, did it harm anyone? Did it bring havoc to the world, as I'm implying? No, exactly the opposite. The collapse of the Soviet Union brought a lot of big advantages to the humanity at large, to the world. The immediate benefits were the ones that we witnessed in Europe. First of all, the removal of an authoritarian regime that history proved that was not livable, despite perhaps the goodwill of the initial stages of the socialists, of the communists, of the Bolsheviks. I know that there are many theories about this and that. Whatever they had in mind didn't work out. And history proves it. I mean, there's no question about it. It collapsed. So the immediate result of that was the liberation of a whole series of countries in Europe that eventually became part of the whole system of the European Union on the, of the West. That also brought, because the time was ripe, a tremendous liberalization of world media. Was it an immediate result of that? Probably it coincided, but we mention it as also a result and an effect of the post-bipolar era. At the same time, we had this boom of the internet, which we didn't know. I mean, when did you first ever see a computer in your life, <laughs> Janine? Like me. So, okay, I, you don't you don't have to to, to, to divulge these these little secrets. But the new generation takes for granted things that for us older people um, were new. So the world changed substantially after 1990, and not only politically, it changed technologically, it, it changed economically, it changed as a matter of contact of people, which is probably the most important element that we are witnessing today. People are in contact throughout the world. There is more visibility, there is more transparency, international relations, in human relations, in economic relations, and that is a blessing. As all blessings, however, these things have inherent problems that sometimes humanity itself, societies, and more, more important and more, let's say, damaging politicians cannot grasp with. And then we come to more specific issues. What exactly happened in the process of this global liberalization, this global interdependence that we all have the benefit of, but at the same time we suffer the results of. And let's come to some other, let's say, historical events, probably that preceded what we're talking about, but that at one point came across the events that followed the collapse of the Soviet Union and the unification of Europe. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the first steps after the Second World War of another movement, by history again proven much more important than Bolshevism, was the efforts of unifying Europe per se. I'm talking about the first steps, which followed of course by, by many other steps, of the unification of the European communities at the time, later becoming the European Union. That happened already six decades ago. And that had in itself the sperm, the seeds 
of unifying Europe and getting a better Europe, a more liberal Europe, a more progressive Europe, a more economically livable Europe and a freer Europe. Well, that happened six decades ago and we will see in the course of the evening where we ended up with. Hopefully, that's not the end of the road. It can go up again. But let's see what was one of the main characteristics that I will repeat tonight uh, of that European conception of people back in the 50s of Schumann and all of those other great personalities. The main idea was strengthening the European Union, the European nations, and the European policies by incorporating and respecting the diversity of each member of the ones that were joining the European Union. Of course, in the beginning, there was not much diversity. We're talking about six members. Then the six members became nine, and then they became ten. And the tenth member, oddly enough, was Greece. And that was already back in 1981. That's long, long time ago. For these 30 years that, even more, that Greece came into the European communities and then now the European Union, my country benefited enormously. Whoever says, and there are those saying the opposite, because again I repeat, like Israelis and Jews in general, Greeks have different opinions and vociferous opinions. So you will have in Greece those saying, well, you know what, the European Union didn't bring anything to Greece but the calamity we're living through today. Well, I remember Greece before the European Union. Again, I'm not that young, so I can remember. And I remember the level, not only of the economic development, but the level of what Professor Moskin said before, which is extremely important, of political freedom, of political development, of social development. And that Greece has nothing to do with the Greece of today, despite the economic woes that we're passing through and that hopefully will pass. Because they will pass because we are mature enough and we are incorporated enough in a stronger family that can help us, together with our actions, to overcome the difficulty. So, let's see how all these things started. The actual issue that we are going to discuss tonight. The Greek crisis and the European crisis. As Janine said before, I was involved in the Olympic Games heavily <laughs> since the time of, of, of the petition to get the Games in Greece until the time we organized them. So I remember very well how Greece looked back in 2004. Didn't look at all like it is today. Not physically, not externally, but psychologically and in the mentality of the people. Greece was literally taken off. In 2004, we organized a magnificent set of summer games, the smaller country ever that organized successfully Olympic Games, Summer Olympic Games. Two, th two years later, 2006, by official OECD statistics, Greece was among the 30 wealthiest nations in the world. That was, what, 10 years ago. And of course, it's not by accident that the Greek word tragedy exists. We are experts in it. We invented it and we practice it in our lives. So there came the Greek tragedy. How did it come about? Okay, there are many theories. I will take the most complicated one because it will be easy to say, as Professor Moskin said, well, you know what? Well, the big Germans just stamped us and they put the boot on us and that's the result of their grandiose politics. Nothing to do with reality. Let's take it a step further and a step back where we started our discussion and talk again about the visions and the directions that Europe had six decades ago, five decades ago, four decades ago, ten years ago. There came the big change. Europe was meant to implement what it had in mind in a, in a structured way with a certain number and nature of member states to a certain direction, provided that everything else around was more or less stable. Well, nothing of that was happening 10 years ago. The world was changing rapidly. The post-bipolar era was followed by other events, relative or non-relative, but other events, however, which were of cataclysmic importance in the Middle East, in Asia, in Africa, that Europe did not really grasp the meaning of them. And now we're living the results of those events. And at the same time, as we said before, a lot of countries were liberated from Eastern Europe, and we decided, rightly so, to incorporate them in the European family where they rightfully belonged. The difference was that Europe, in order to be able to go from 10 members that we were saying before, 16 at the time of the big enlargement of 2004, to 29 members currently, 
it needed to make its basis more solid, financially, structurally, mainly politically. We didn't do any of that. I was in the European Union at the time, so probably I'm part, partly to blame for a decade before that, actually, in the 90s. And we were saying that we would have to integrate Europe in order eventually to get more members in. And at the time, we're talking about members, because I was doing the negotiation, like Sweden, Norway, Austria. Norway never came in because there was a referendum that they voted against. But they have concluded successfully their negotiations. I know because I was presiding at them. Austria, four countries. And for those countries, we're saying, you know what? To be able to smoothly incorporate these countries, which were more advanced than the European Union, we need to deepen our integration. We never agreed to that, institutionally, institutionally at least. We enlarged, and then we make the big mistake, not making a favor to the countries coming in, to enlarge by 13, 14 countries, literally overnight. In 2003, 2004, we were brought Malta and Cyprus, fine, to Western European democracies, and 12 countries that now they're you know, capable of following up the evolution of the European Union, but now it's the wrong moment. At the time, they were not. And they were not because for two generations, they had gone through a system, an indoctrination of two generations that had turned them to something completely different of the direction that Europe was going. They didn't know what the thing was about. The only thing they had in mind was very simple, and I have no hesitations in saying now, because now it's too late anyway to change anything, let's get into the European Union to get more money, to become more affluent from what they used to know, and to get revenge on the Soviets. Two small mistakes. The European Union does not give money away. Greece found it out lately in a very dramatic way. It creates money. It creates income. And in order to be able to create income, you have to be competitive and you have to be part of the mentality of the European Union. None of the countries that came in that I mentioned was at that stage. Secondly, the moment they came in, the Soviet Union did not exist anymore. But still they wanted to take revenge on someone. And that someone was what became after the, the Soviet Union. And you have what you have now in Europe vis-a-vis -vis Russia. It's not a one-way street. I'm not going to advocate in favor of Putin saying, you know what? He's a good guy. No, he's not. But let's see a little bit what the European attitude, let alone the American attitude, was against the post-Soviet Russia and what pushed Russia to become what it is, and I'm afraid, what it's going to become in the future. So, probably we enlarged at the wrong moment with the wrong recipe, and we did not foresee what was coming to the European Union from elsewhere, from outside. What was coming to Europe from the outside? What am I talking about? What happened? What's wrong with Europe? Everything is wrong with Europe, because we did not foresee what was coming. Not being able to integrate properly, politically and financially, meant that we introduced a euro, a common currency, before we ever had a common financial fiscal policy. Well, even a first year undergraduate student in any university, including the Greek ones, would tell you that in order to have a common currency, you need a system how this currency is going to work. What are the limitations? Who is going to provide for it? Who is going to set the limits of what use and not abuse can be done by this currency? Well, none of that was there because there was not a common fiscal and monetary policy. Still, there is not. Now we are elaborating on it in the European Union, which meant that almost 30 different states, not all of them were in the euro, admittedly, but they all had practice in the euro in their exchanges, were heading their own policies, their own ideas, their own little petty party uh, interests in every particular country. Greece, of course, not excluded. Probably that was one of the main reasons. That, that's why I'm going through that direction to give you an idea what brought about the crisis and the magnitude and the lasting crisis that we are witnessing in Greece. We did not have the tools. We did not have the means, not as Greece, but as Europe. Well, how naked Europe was will be proven in the things that I'm going to demonstrate to you in a, in a few moments. On top of all of that, apart from the crisis that happened around the world, where Europe had a very little role to play because it was not prepared to do these kind of things. We had no European policy on what happens in Afghanistan. We had no European policy on what happens in the Middle East, except bashing on Israel occasionally, just you know, to, to keep ourselves busy. We had no plan and no vision of what was going to happen in North Africa, or unfortunately, this is probably a nightmare that is brewing up 
what is going to happen because of climatic changes and political instability in the sub-Saharan Africa. Europe had no idea of that. We're in our fortress, we're liberalizing our policies, we're liberalizing our monetary policies, we're liberalizing our migratory policies, the Schengen system, and anyone who can step his foot on the soil of any European nation that is included in Schengen can move around freely. Fine, but we conceived that so that Greeks and Norwegians could go from Athens to Oslo and from Oslo to Athens. We had not visioned that the people from Asmara or Addis Ababa or I don't know where would like, would like to come to, to Greece, and we'll talk about that, and the whole of Europe. Is that bad? I mean, is Europe becoming a fortress closing its, its borders to, to foreigners? That's not it. But I'm saying that before even thinking of all of that, we came out running and being enthusiastic about letting everybody becoming a European Union member, liberalizing our economies, liberalizing our monetary system, and be happy about it. Well, not everybody was so happy because they did not belong to Europe. Neither those hedge funds that also is an indirect result of the collapse of the Soviet Union just appeared out of the blue. Whoever had the notion of a hedge fund or a tiger economy back in the 80s, what are these terms? All these things happened when the hegemony of the only superpower that remained in the world thought that this, through this globalization, a lot of smart people, mistake, a few smart people can make a lot of billions. Well, the rest, all the rest can suffer, who cares? It's a free economy, it's a free country, it's a free system. Well, that free system, when applied in unequal terms between partners that cannot cope up with inequalities of such a globalized economic system, is not going to work, and it's not working. And a, a very easy example, that was the beginning of the Greek crisis, to be more specific and not be so philosophical as I have been so far. In 2008, there was a scandal, a big crash in the United States that normally should have no effect at all in Europe. I'm talking about the Lehman Brothers and the real estate uh, bubble that blew up in the United States. We were watching it on TV, and we had the prime minister at the time with a very famous name, very small political size. However, we came out very proudly in the, in the, in the Greek parliament, I will never forget that evening, and said pompously to the Greek parliamentarians and to the Greek public, Fear not. That was the end of 2008. After the crisis had already started, you know, <laughs> coming into Europe, but not to Greece yet. Fear not. The Greek economy has nothing to fear because it's very stable. It's based on real estate, construction, and consumption. Those were the first things that collapsed immediately when the monetary crisis hit our doors and the various attacks by the hedge funds, by the tiger economies, came to the Greek stock market, came to the Greek economy, and our deficit and our debt showed up what it really was. Nobody was giving us any money anymore. So you know what? You owe us a little bit of money, you have to return it. But that was not the deal. The deal was that we come in the European Union, we get all these, all these nice bonds and these nice uh, uh, loans, we spend as much as we like, and through consumption, we increase our GDP. What did I tell you before? By 2006, Greece was among the 30 wealthiest countries in the world, with money of others, however, who were not producing the money that was circulating in Greece. So at the moment that someone who owned this money demanded his money back, we were, we were caught with our pants down, to put it literally. So that was the beginning of the crisis. Politically, financially, economically, socially, morally, Greece, not only Greece, unfortunately, had not anticipated even a bit of this. The big problem was, as I was saying before, that Europe itself had not realized, it, had not realized what was hitting Europe and Greece in particular. Why Greece in particular? Because Greece was the more, let's say, the less developed and the less organized of these economies <coughs> and of these societies. And now I come to our own responsibility. So as I said before, I'm not going to say at any point of, of our discussion tonight that Greece is not to blame. This is of someone else. This is an imported crisis. Someone else had to foresee it. Therefore, why should we care? Why should we pay for that? We should pay for a number of reasons that I will tell you. But still, the problem was not a small Greece with a 2%, 2.5% of the European GDP had a crisis. The problem was that the rest of the 98 .5, 97.5% of the GDP didn't know at all what to do about it. We did not have the means, I'm talking as European Union now, 
We do not have the tools, actually. We do not have the institutions to cope with such a small crisis, let alone if that crisis, God forbid, had hit at a greater degree of, of what it did, actually, had hit Italy, for instance. If we have a big deficit, if we have a big debt at this point, which is less than 250 billion euros, which is a lot, but still, it's a fraction of the debt of Italy, which is much more than one trillion at this point, billion. And they have no means to repay it. Let's be sure about it. So Europe had no idea what to do. So what did it do? First of all, it panicked, which is the easy way out. Secondly, it said, OK, we don't have the solution. Let's try to start building the institutions. The ESN, for instance, that exists now, did not exist at the time. That was a product of the Greek crisis. And let's bring, and that was the, 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 the final nail of the coffin, let's bring others who know about these things. Who knows about the economic crisis around the world? Well, the IMF. They know. They, you know, they lend money to people. They deal with bankrupt economies, yes. They deal with bankrupt economies in Central Africa, in some parts of Asia, in Latin America. They had never before dealt with an economy, an advanced economy, an economy that was following all the rules of the European Union system and could not follow the various recipes that the IMF was proposing and already admittedly, the, at the highest level, people from IMF were saying, you know what, we were wrong. Our calculations were wrong, our projections were wrong, the recipes for the solution we're giving were wrong. But still, someone had to pay for all of that. And unfortunately, it were the people that are paying. And in such cases of crisis, that happened back in 1929 in the, in, in the United States, for instance, or later, in other cases, the poorer are the ones to pay first. And they can pay extremely hard. And now we're coming to the Greek situation. So by the beginning, let's say, of 2010, and as it was coming in, the whole program of the Troika, as we called it, which is the combination of the lenders' party, as we said, which was the IMF, the European Commission, and the, the European Bank. Now it's also the ESM, therefore no more Troika, it's a quartet. We're coming with solutions that, first of all, was damaging really bad the, the, the average sense of, of, of uh, dignity and real income of the Greek society, but at the end of the day was damaging the economy itself, and it was not helping it come out of the crisis. And that's why we're, in, for the seventh year now, still in the same situation, still in the same crisis, and there's no solution in the visible future. I'm talking about months, not years, because that, I'm, I'm less pessimistic in that. Why did it happen in Greece? We touched it very peripherally, and we didn't go deeply into the real cause of the Greek, uh, let's say, um, responsibility for this. Greece had never, because of politics, of petty politics, that I'm sure you have no idea what that is here in Israel, because no such thing exists in Israel. The parties do not put their party on top of the, of the state and of the people. It never happens. But in Greece, it happens. And for decades, it happened. The main political parties were putting the interest of their clientele and their own political survival on top of the Greek interest in general. They were avoiding any kind of transformation, any kind of modernization, any kind of measure that would lose votes to their party in order to avoid political repercussions. Well, the, result, the end result is that the whole political system became null and void as far as the average Greek citizen is concerned. Thus, you can see the, the fluctuation of the electoral results of the last years, which are unbelievable. I mean, from one moment to the next, a party that had 4% in two decades that it appeared in the Greek politics, the reformist left, as we call it, Syriza, came to 34% and gained power. In one night, I mean, in, in one year, the percentage went from 4 to 10 to 15 to 34. We had no fascism in Greece. Why? I mean, officially at least. Because we had suffered in the Second World War, as Jews had, our Jews suffered even more. Greece was occupied, we had a resistance, we fought fascism, we fought Nazism, we really hated the whole concept. Well, out of the blue, because of the crisis, you saw a neo-fascist party. Of course, they say they're ultra-nationalist. Well, whoever can explain the difference to me, please do, because personally, as a you know, moderately literate person, I cannot see the difference, especially when I hear their slogans, and even worse, when I see their practices. They actually have murdered a person on the street because he was a leftist. So I don't see the big difference. They went from non-existent, 1%, 3%, 4%, 
10%. And then there was, thank God, the limit that turned them around, and now they're back to 5%. But I'm trying to demonstrate the fact that the whole political system, because of their behavior up to the crisis, lost their sense of justification vis-a-vis -vis the Greek society. That could not accept the system anymore, could not accept this balance. They said, you're responsible. It's easy to, to, to throw the responsibility to someone else. Most of the people, therefore, were not trying to see the responsibility they had themselves for years of tax evasion. That was, of course, pardoned by the parties of, 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 of usurping public lands, of putting fire so that you could get your sheep to graze on that land, or you could build your villa on that land, for appropriating funds from the European Union that was supposed to be going to development, and instead of that, buying a Porsche. Greece, at one point, was the, the, in absolute numbers, not in percentage, the country with the most Porsche Cayenne in Europe. I mean, like if we were Abu Dhabi, for instance. Of course, we've sold all of that now. Still. Horse? Uh, Porsche? Porsche, Porsche, Porsche Cayenne. Porsche. That costs more or less, in I European, know. because I know here it costs even more, something like 150,000 euros, at least. So, and people had them. I mean, people that were farmers had them. And one asked, how could a farmer buy a Porsche Cayenne? It's easy. You get the money from the European Union, the same European Union that I was telling you before, that had not foreseen that there would be a desertification in Africa, a crisis in the Middle East, that same Europe, that was giving the money like this to Portugal, to Italy, to Greece, and said, you know what? Buy products. These are good products made in Germany. Therefore, here is the, the currency with which you can buy them. I give you, you know, interest zero. Take it. Well, at one point, the money would have to go back. Nobody is in a position to give it back at this point. So anyway, not to banalize the conversation, let's come back to what repercussions did this whole um, embroglio brought not only to Greece, because Greece were already talked about it. I mean, I can, I can cite figures, but that wouldn't make a big difference. I mean, for instance, from 2009 to today, we've lost 25% of our GDP, 25%. Salaries have gone down more or less by 30%. The debt in the beginning of the crisis was at 127, now it's at 185. And that is also the answer of how successful these recipes of solving the problem are. I mean, if the recipes were correct, how come our debt is going up since our income is going down? It's very simple. It's just, you know, you make the division. What is the debt? If you divide your GDP, and then comes the result. The less GDP you have, the more you owe. So do we want to talk about unemployment, for instance? It reached the peak of 27. Now it's going back down again. But 27, I mean, I think in Gaza it's more or less that kind of percentage. And we're talking about the European Union state. So, but that's, that's Greece, okay. We admit our faults, we admit our, 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 our mistakes. Let's see how we can get out of it. But what happened in the rest of Europe? I mean, did this crisis hit the rest of Europe? Yes, it did. Did it have bad results on it? Yes, it had. You see the whole of the South. See the relations between the countries of the South and the countries of the North and how they interact. Where is the trust that we had? Where was this federal dream that we were nourishing? two decades ago. Where was this motto that I mentioned before, strength through the diversity and respect of each other? Instead of that, we had harsh measures imposed by the ones who could afford them to the ones that had to receive them because otherwise they would starve. Well, that's not exactly, not only the dream of our forefathers like Schumann and even Delors, which is, who is much more recent and I had the pleasure and the honor to serve under him, but even of the everyday European and the reaction, of course, in, in connection with the other external factors that we will briefly discuss also, was that the dream of a Europe going jointly ahead is fading away very rapidly. And it's going to go even worse if we don't, let's say, overturn the situation as soon as possible. How can that be done? In several ways. Are we doing that? No, we're not. So what happened in Greece? over the last year, because I'm sure that you are interested in seeing where are we headed, in which way, and by whom. So the situation, as I told you before, was on a table. Even by, by 2014, it was obvious that the coalition government of the socialists and the conservatives could not hold up anymore. The leftist opposition was gaining power by promising anything you could imagine, but also counting on the fact that the people were seeing, even the most blind people could see, that the solution was not working. We were not going in the right direction. And people were reacting because if you lose everything, 
what else do you have to lose? I mean, you, you say, okay, I will try something else. So there was those that, saying, that were saying, you know what, if that left comes to power, you will lose even what is left in, in your pockets. The little that is left, you will lose everything. You will become another Albania of the time of the Hoxha, meaning at the time of the communist regimes. You will do this, you will do that. People didn't even listen to that. And the result was, of course, that when constitutional exigencies asked that we had a new president of the republic, therefore the agreement of the parliament had to be achieved, the number of parliamentarians was not available, beginning of 2015, therefore, elections were proclaimed, Syriza just walked through them, they got 34%, almost, almost a self-sufficient government, almost, but that, that almost made a big change, probably to the best. They had to make a coalition with another party. The more eager party they found was converging with them, not ideologically, quite the contrary, but conversing with them politically and in slogans against the austerity measures. That was a quite to the right small party called Danel, and they are still in the coalition with the government. But what happened in that year from the beginning of 2015 until today is that we managed to have two elections and a referendum in one year, and still we did not collapse. And to make it a little bit more, let's say, serious, I must admit, as a typical bureaucrat that was seeing all this thing with a lot of skepticism, saying, my God, where are we heading with this kind of, of talk, with this kind of slogan against the, the European Union? Because at one point in the summer, it reached a very crucial instance that the majority of the public during the referendum days was becoming not anti-Troik or anti-measure, but anti-European. And if that had prevailed, would be the, the end of Greece as we know it, probably the end of the European Union as we know it as well. Thank God, the good God of Greece probably is the good God of Israel as well. Probably must be the same God. Because with all the mistakes, excuse my saying, that the two nations are making, the fact that we're surviving and we're doing well, by the way, <laughs> is only a miracle. So there must be a good God. Things went for the best. What do I mean? The new young prime minister of this leftist party managed, nobody understood how he did that, but it was really a magic trick. I asked him personally when he was here two months ago, he's going to come at the end of the month, we'll discuss this in a minute, and I asked him personally because he's a very easygoing person. So, Mr. President, how did you manage that? I mean, without having a fight within your party, with the opposition, with the Europeans, you triumphed in three elections without doing anything particular to do that. And he smiled at me. It's a, he didn't answer, of course. It's a miracle. He managed to get his leftist party, in a way, through the referendum, to get in exposure all those that were so fanatic that were advocating openly to leave not only the Euro system, but the European Union. And there were these people, there were in his central committee. He managed to get rid of them. How? He asked for the referendum. He won the referendum against the European Union. Then immediately after he came into negotiation with the European Union, very difficult, very long negotiations, he actually stayed in the room for more than 18 hours with the rest of the European leaders, and they came out with a result, which the people in his party, the ones that I mentioned before, didn't like. So you don't like it? I'm sorry, but then we have to go to elections. Not party elections, because there it would be much more difficult to him. Let's go to the people again and see what the people have to say about that. And the people gave him a new mandate. So the fanatics were out, the opposition was, was thrust for a second time, therefore no opposition in the measures he's taking. And the Europeans were very happy with this guy that managed to pass the measures, playing it also that I'm the leftist guy who is helping the poor. Can any one of you do that? I cannot. So the guy is, you know, someone to, to reason with. So, where do we go from here? What is happening as we talk? What is, what is the solution? Where are we headed? There are very serious negotiations, hard negotiations, tough negotiations on implementations, on implementation of the new package deal we had with the rest of the European Union that takes definitely Greece out of the position that was until the last year with this infamous slogan that had prevailed in Europe called the Grexit. There is no more question about Greece exiting anything. Nobody wants that, Greeks don't want that, the Europeans don't want that. Europe cannot afford this kind of jokes at this particular junction. So, there are difficult measures to take. The big difference with the past is that now, finally, everybody in Europe and in Greece have realized that either we implement some measures, but those measures have to have a very definite goal, which can be lessening of the unemployment, 
rapid development, really changing structural deficiencies of the Greek system. Otherwise, we cannot get out of this. Everybody agrees on that. It's going relatively well. The opposition, as of yesterday, has a new leader, a young guy, conservative, who is also very pro-European. So there are no more voices, serious voices at least, that advocate drastic solutions against anything else than pure logic and than synthetic solutions that the European Union is an expert at. Europe has still a big advantage. It can get all different opinions, all different views, all different sides, get them on the table and get a result. Probably sometimes the result is not implemented, but we get a result. And in those small steps, we can advance to our common goals. The common goals of the Greek people, the Greek government, and Europe. And that can be no different. They are all the same. What are these goals? I can only speak for the goals that the Greek side has, that I personally have, that I fully share with the Greek society, probably with the Greek government as well. Obviously, they think that I share them, otherwise I would be removed, I suppose. <laughs> Although it's still, as Professor said, a democracy. <laughs> so what are these goals? We are convinced that Europe is not abandoning and should not abandon the ideals and the directives in which it was built. And what are those? Full respect of democratic values. After all, democracy was born in Europe, and especially in a country that is passing a big crisis right now and whose representative is talking to you. Full respect of human rights, full respect of a free economy, but on a just and viable way. Not a circus economy, not an economy of a casino, not an economy where people can make billions and others can starve. A fair and just Europe for all. And this has to happen. I'm not advocating any, any leftist party, but Europe has to see that the neoliberal policies that it had advocated over the last decades, probably affected by other similar policies that were carried on in another part of the world that was constructed to function like this. The United States never had the structure and the ideals that were guiding the European Union since its conception. It's a totally different ballgame. Now, the fact that we live in a globalized world and there is a constant interaction about the economies and the societies of Europe and the United States does not at any point mean that we have to turn our Europe into a neoliberal thing that is not represented even in the United States right now and behave in a way that is not, let's say, faithful to what we are representing. And what we're representing is what I just mentioned. Europe had had an exemplary system of social justice, of health and, and common, common service programs, of education, of liberalization of movement. If we give up all that, then we don't really need to have a European Union. And there I will agree with the more fanatics Eurosceptics in Europe. And unfortunately, they're, they're popping up like mushrooms because of the crisis. That is not hitting only Europe. And is that crisis limited only to the financial sector? I just said, already said, no, it's much deeper than that. And if we lose the rest of it, then we're doomed. And I'm talking about the social structure, the social cohesion, the basic characteristic of Europe, which was accepting and welcoming different opinions, different people, even waves of immigrants in, a, in an orderly way, of course, and not closing our doors and our eyes on whatever is different. If we do that, we're going back to a Europe of the 19th century and centuries before that. Zanin is much more expert to tell you about how Europe looked those, in, those, in those centuries. We do not want to become xenophobic anymore. We do not want to revert to racism, which brings anti-Semitism on the way. We have had the experience, and it was a very dark one, especially for Jews, but also for European nations. We don't want to go back to spheres of interest, because we're seeing this kind of phenomena in the modern contemporary European Union, where bigger states are already creating spheres of influence, be it in the Balkans, be it in the Baltic states, be it in the Central Asia, where they're antagonizing Russia with various investments, and so on and so forth. We don't want that kind of Europe. It's very dangerous. It's inhuman. It's going to be our doomsday. Hopefully, we're not going down that road. Hopefully, Europe is strong enough to withstand the big challenges that we're facing now, now, right now. And I'm repeating one more time, it's not, they're not only uh, economic or social. They're human, and they come from the outside. What is coming from outside lately? The migration movements. Had we foreseen that thing? I told you already we didn't. What is, what is it causing to Europe and in particular to Greece? The worst possible scenario could evolve. 
as we speak, even now in the winter months, more than two or three thousand immigrants, refugees, per day are hitting the Greek shores. Per day. I mean, the Israeli government is making a big fuss about how many illegal immigrants you have to, to legalize, 10,000, something like that. Well, we're receiving 4,000 per day. In a country that is undergoing the economic crisis that we're undergoing, and during the summer, the numbers were up to 10,000 per day. Do they stay in Greece? No, I don't want to exaggerate. Usually they want to pass through and go to other countries that they feel, rightly so perhaps, that they will have a better future. Well, the issue is that several of our partners in the European Union, thinking about themselves, which of course is their right, but it's not the solution of the Europe that we're talking about, are building up fences, are attacking immigrants, are throwing them out, are humiliating them, neglecting them, and ultimately not allowing them to pass through. What will that lead to? Thousands of people will be blocked in Greece. And since we do not have, you know, woods and, and cliffs to put barbed wires and start beating women and children, as others, unfortunately, in Europe have done and continue doing, we have our sea. So when Europe comes to us sometimes, several states, several partners of ours, and they tell me, you are not protecting the European borders properly. You are not doing your job. What exactly are they telling us? Should we allow people to drown? Should we perhaps shoot them in the sea? Because we have a very, very mighty navy despite our crisis, which is cooperating enormously with the Israeli navy. Should we put our gunboats and start you know, machining gun, down women and children? Is that what our European partners are telling us? Instead of trying to find a solution that will accommodate the needs of those that really are in need and in desperate need of help, like the Syrian refugees. Mind you, from the Syrian refugees that have come through Greece, there are more than 300,000 at this point, we never registered even one incident of violation of any law. There were law-abiding people, most of them had the money to pass through Greece in a decent way and go to their destination. They never posed one problem. Problems do arise from others that take advantage of this unfortunate fate of the Syrian people, are coming with them and trying to pass through. And unfortunately, nowadays, we have uh, lots of, of, of people coming from countries that do not justify for refugee status or do not undergo any visible threat to their lives or to their dignity. We have Moroccans, we have Algerians. Now, of course, the question to those of you that have a, a troubled mind and want to find you know, uh, conspiracy theories would be, what does a Moroccan do in the GNC coming to Greece? Why does he go through Spain? because he finds a much more eager sending state to dispatch him in a dinghy boat to Greece. And we all know what country lies to the east of Greece. Why do they do it? Why does Turkey behave like that? Do they want to harm us? Mainly not. They couldn't care less about Greece at this point. They want, in their own way, and they have a big experience of that, to extract the most possible exchange in, 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 in material goods or in political advantages they come from the European Union. And they have already received quite quite a few things. They want advancement in their um, accession negotiations, which we do not oppose if it becomes in an orderly way. They want visa liberalization. They want money, which they received already. And most important, they want the easing of criticism to the regime. So say, well, what we do in Turkey is our, is our problem. You will have a bigger problem with all these migrants that we cannot stop. They were stopping them until one year ago. Now all of a sudden they can't stop them anymore. Uh, that will come into Europe. Therefore, your criticism about how we handle, uh, let's say, minorities or the journalists uh, should not be your concern. Well, I, I stop at that. The, the problem remains we have thousands of people hitting the Greek shores, even now in winter time. We're trying our best. We're not shooting people. We're not letting people drown. We give them the most possible help we can under the circumstances in Greece, which are not the best in the world, as you can understand at this point. And we're facilitating them in any way we can. This is not a Greek problem. This is a European problem, probably a global problem. If we do not cooperate quickly about this, the repercussions will be unimaginable, not only for Greece, but for Europe as well. And they will have to do with the things that I said before about xenophobia, about the lack of democratic freedoms, about the structure of Europe itself. I don't know how we can function our singing system, our liberalization of movement, if we do not cooperate and we start putting up barbed wires in every single country that they have to cross from Greece up to Sweden. And this is happening as we speak, unfortunately. I don't want to take more of your time. Uh, probably I will just put uh, a little word at the end 
about our, our neighborhood, because I'm sure some of you are interested in, in this. Um, there is, um, there was actually, not anymore, because those silly people that were trying to advocate this theory proved so wrong that they, they, they hid themselves somewhere. When we started approaching the two countries, I mean, together, that was several years ago, but especially the last five years, there were those that came up saying, oh, okay, we know what's happening. Well, Israel had the debacle of the Mavi Marmara, and the Greeks are perennial uh, foes of the Turks. Therefore, the enemy of your enemy is my friend, etc., etc. Therefore, Greece and Israel are, are having a pact together against Turkey. It couldn't be proven more wrong. First of all, because Israel is approaching Turkey right now, under our blessing, because we would very welcome see Turkey coming to its senses and re-establishing full relations with Israel for the very simple reason that we need stability factors in the entire region. And if you look at our map and the situation that is happening in the Eastern Mediterranean, you will find a great number of democratic and uh, cooperating states, the following three, Israel, Greece, Cyprus. So we need the more possible partners we can find. And it was in that sense that Greece very seriously, very solemnly, after a big and deep strategic planning decided five, ten years ago to start improving its relations with Israel. And Israel reciprocated spontaneously because that kind of analysis the Israeli side had done a long time ago. So we are, thank God, at the stage where my presence in Israel is really not needed. It's, it's an automatic pilot. It's, it couldn't go better. As I told you before, the Prime Minister was here with half the government a month ago, and they're coming again at the end of this month, and the next morning they're moving to Cyprus, all three governments, Israeli government, Cyprus government, and the Greek government, to enhance and deepen our cooperation. I don't want to go into details of this cooperation, but it's very meaningful in a number of, of sectors, financially, economically, in terms of development, in terms of societies, and also in terms of defense and stability of the region. And as I said before, this will prove beneficial to the entire region. We are not doing it only for our own national interest, neither Israel nor Greece. We are doing it for ourselves, but we are also doing it because we are worried, really worried, about the stability of the region. That is non-existent. And you can see it by going up to the Golan. You don't have to go far. You know better than anyone else in the world what does it mean to live in such a neighborhood. And we respect that. And we come finally to understand it a little bit better. And we are side to side on this. In a number of, of fields, we are surpassing ourselves. Probably I'm wrong. We are not surpassing ourselves because we're Jews and we're Greeks. And these are two unique peoples. I'm not going to brag about Greece, and you should not be bragging about Israel yourselves. But it is a fact. These are two unique peoples. And it was about time that these two peoples came together in the most significant possible way and joined their forces for the good of humanity in general. Is that too ambitious? Probably it is. But as Golda Meir or Ben Gurion, it was never cleared out who of the two had said the phrase, if you don't believe in miracles, you are not a realist. Therefore, when you see at the history of Israel or the history of Greece, you have to believe in miracles to see the reality. And if you see the relations between Greece and Israel nowadays, and if you go back, as Anin said, 20 years ago when I was here in Israel again, then you certainly believe in miracles. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador, for this so meaningful opening lecture. You not only gave us a thorough historical overview of uh, Greece into the EU, uh, you also gave us the lead for the coming uh, series of lectures. In fact, you passed each other, each one uh, uh, in review, and thank you very much for it. Your meaningful uh, analysis, I suppose, uh, is going to be uh, in uh, question, not in question, of course, but uh, well, there are I going would to like be it to be to, There are going to be questions, even if it's not in question itself. And thank you for uh, leading us out of despair. <laughs> we were almost desperate about the uh, future of uh, 
of Greece. Of Greece. So thank you for giving us. We have never managed to die. I mean, for for three thousand years, as you have done also. Exactly. Despite so, our own mistakes, so, so it cannot be done. You, thank you for leading us into hope. So I'm opening the floor for questions, please. and uh, please, sir. Thank you for your comments. Based on your experience, it seems like Greece has been the experiment, the first experiment under pressure for the economic community uh, 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 European Union. Based on what you've seen on both sides, what do you think will happen with the other southern Mediterranean economies, Italy, Spain, Portugal, uh, given the fact that we don't see a lot of economic growth anywhere in the world, really, that usually is able to pull countries out of a recession? It's a very good question, and um, probably I implied the, the recipes and the solutions for it um, through my, my arguments. If Europe does not come to its senses and realize that they need, we need to go back to our roots and proceed in the process that we started this with, unity through diversity, and we continue practicing and advocating solely, I repeat, solely neoliberal uh, solutions, we will fail. It's, it's as simple as that. There will be no growth. There will be major social unrest in countries much more meaningful than Greece. You mentioned Italy. I can also mention Spain, for instance. And we've seen what kind of, of issues were raised and got not so vividly this time, but who knows about the next time in the last Spanish elections. At least in the Greek elections, we never had parties or tendencies of breaking the country apart. Mm -hmm. If we continue neglecting the common vision of a unified Europe when regions like Catalonia or Vizcaya can have their own voice and be respected for that, and the only solution is the one proposed by the IMF, I'm not having anything against the IMF. It can be very useful where it's needed. I don't think Europe should be needing IMF, but we continue to ask for their help they're contributing a minimum amount of money in the overall burden that Europe is sharing to help Greece, Portugal, or Ireland. Ireland is out of it, thank God. Cyprus, for instance. And they're having a big mouth. They're telling us what to do, probably from their experience in El Salvador or Mali or uh, I don't know where else. But they should start looking that there are different cases, different societies in different balances. So my answer, in short, is either we change course and we become what we should be already, or we're going to fail. Professor Motzke? You know, suppose I did the following. I'm going to play this game for a second. Suppose I'm in charge of the EU. You've got 185 billion euro in debt or something like that. And I'll tell you what. I'll give you 18.5 billion every year, and in 10 years your debt will be canceled. There will be no more debt. In return for which, though, I want the following thing. I want you to change your social rules. I want you to get rid of your pension system, make sure everybody retires at 67. I want you to, and I want you to have a fundamental revision of the rules by which Greek society operates. Could you meet that? This is exactly the question that has been asked from the Greek governments for the last six years. But they're not willing to pay. But it was, it was asked in, an, in such an awkward, abrupt, and amateurish way that each successive government was thinking, well, if I do that, I won't be the government the next day. Yeah. So what's the advantage? Now, we have arrived at the point, and it's, it's meaningful, that we close the circle of possible political solutions for the average voter. The voter knows that by voting for Syriza twice, he has no other option, unless he wants to turn to the Golden Dawn, to the fascists, and then lose even the country itself. Because, I mean, you have a nationalist government of a non-so, let's say, potent country, you can imagine the results with the neighborhood that we live in. So, unless Greeks become totally crazy, which I don't think is the case, uh, we have exhausted all the possible solutions that could avoid what you're mentioning. Because this is the solution, this is the proposal you will receive the funds necessary to restructure your economy, not to, to pay your debts, but to restructure your economy so you can generate income to repay your debts. But in return, you have to modernize yourselves. Otherwise, you will never reach that point of being able to repay. Well, the last phrase, finally, it seems to be understood by the Greek public. And this is the turning point. 
people know that they have no other alternative. Even the ones that were thinking, okay, Tsipras is a magic you know, stick and he will do everything by intimidating the Europeans. Now they see that he's following with, let's say, intricate differences and changes that are coming about, and people see those changes, especially the poorer people, with condoning of the European Union, that also saw its mistakes that we mentioned before, said, okay, you know what? Probably we went too fast, too abruptly, too harshly. Let's see how we can, in a consensus way, all go to the same direction that we can all solve our problems in the best possible way, not the ideal way. But that is the deal, what you just mentioned. We are receiving funds in exchange of restructuring the economy. That's what's happening. Whether it will succeed or not, I cannot know. Please. Uh, thanks for the talk. I have three short questions. Uh, the first one is rather to go back to the past, as you referred a very speculative question, uh, referring, okay, the, the question would be, um, if Greece would have been now in a better position, if all these uh, liberalization efforts from the conservative uh, government between 1993 would have passed back, back then. So this is the first, like the old Manos agenda, to put it in a way, okay? The second question is, I'm referring to where you stop uh, the answer to Professor Motskin, if you can say something about how, to your opinion, um, about the change that happened because of, during the crisis in terms of political landscape. Like, to put it in another way, this, you referred to this twice, I think, there's no other option from Syria at the moment. To put it in a provoking way, the way I see it now, from the populist right-wing like, uh, party, independent Greeks, to Syria, there's not a big difference at the moment. Like, there's not other alternative it's to my, for the next couple of years, at least. And uh, the third one, like you've described very well, how the president of the, or the prime minister isolated um, or outsmarted his internal opposition, okay, with a referendum and the next elections. So the question would be if such a smart prime minister or president of his party had uh, uh, a minister, like finance minister, like Mr. Varoufakis in first place. Thank you. I will particularly enjoy the last one. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure we have a lot to discuss on that. Now, uh, the first one is rather straightforward. Would Greece have been, would have been in a better position if we had done the measures uh, that were, administered, uh, were uh, uh, proposed to be administered back in the 1990s, or I would add, in the 2000s by Ganitsis, because Ganitsis was a minister of health and social security during the times, the good times of Greece, the, men, the ones I mentioned that were among the 30 more wealthy nations in the world, that at the time he said, you know what, we have to cut down on pensions a little bit, a little bit. Had we done that then, we would be much better off. So the answer is obvious. If we had done all the measures that needed to be done in Greece anyway, despite the crisis, and as Professor Motskin said before, we wouldn't have to you know, rely on foreign aid, None of this would have happened, but you know, it's easy in history. If Hitler had anticipated that it would be a heavy winter, he would have never gone to Stalingrad, so, or Napoleon for that matter. So we, I mean, we can make all the announcements you would like about the past. It didn't happen for the reasons that I mentioned. No party had the guts, let's put it this way, to, to, to go boldly ahead. And for very, I mean, they were not stupid. They knew that the Greek society was in such a configuration, we don't want to go back to history. I'm, I'm, you, you're of Greek origin, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you know very well our history, where we come from, civil war, dictatorship, the, 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 the turning of the dictatorship to a democracy in 1974, as Professor Moskin mentioned. And that at that point, anything that was not of the extreme right, that was not dictatorship, that was no, not fascist, was pardoned. Anyone could do anything and everything was legal. Nobody would question the legality or the, the political valor of, of, of real crooks, like the ones that are in prison right now. So the history is the history. We didn't do what we had to do back in the 90s. We're paying for it now. Unfortunately, it was coupled by a more general European crisis and a global interaction that is out of hand for Europe in itself. Now, coming to the second question. There is a misunderstanding there. I never said there is no alternative to, to Syriza. What I said is that we have gone through the whole circle and there's no alternative to the policies that are being applied now, 
coincidentally by Syriza, it could have been done by the previous government. Probably this new government has, let's say, a more, for the time being, a more receptive audience because, in theory, ideologically, it's more near the, the, the poor masses. That's what the left is all about. But as you say, if, if in practice it proves that the measures now are worse than before, thank God we're having a democracy, the, the government will be overturned. And as I said before, there's a new leader of the opposition. He could come in and he could win the next election. Who knows? Now, the third question about Prime Minister Tsipras being so, um, let's say, forward-looking, and how could he have the finance minister that we all remember of, who could not, even if you turn your television in Hong Kong or in, in Dubai, he would be there. He would, I mean, even if, if you didn't turn your television on, he would come pop you on the, on the shoulder and say, turn on the television, I'm giving an interview. No, the guy seemed to be inadequate, to say the least, proved to be. But I will reverse the question. Was he the only one that was inadequate in the first government of Syriza? So there's your answer. He had people around him that they grew together from 4% to 30%, and he could not just say the moment that he won power, you know what? I fooled you all. I don't need you because I know you're buffoons. Now I'm taking technocrats to represent the party that brought me to power. He had to rely on the people he had around him. And those people, the first six months before the referendum, proved, as far as I know and as far as everybody has seen, extremely inadept for these positions. How diplomatic you put it. Uh, thank you. Please. Um, do you feel Just that... Just a second. Do you feel... Does Mike can it? I can hear perfectly well. <laughs> for the recording. For the recording. Ah, for okay. the recording. Do you feel that the... Um, Can you hold the microphone because you are, you're causing a problem to our registration? I'm sorry. Do you feel that a, the old parties do their work, their homework, or are they just standing by and listening to Syriza and thinking how, how foolish we were all those years? Good question. I wish, brother, I do not wish. I was one of the leaders of these parties. No, on second thought, I do not wish that I was a leader of those parties mainly because they're in, in, in deep trouble internally. Uh, let's talk about the old parties that you mentioned. What is left of them? You have a PASOK, everybody knows the PASOK, that is down now to 3%. All the first analysis that I've heard out after the, the, the victory of Mitsotakis, the younger Mitsotakis, who is now the leader of the opposition, foresee that in the next month, in the next polls, or if we have an election, God forbid, uh, PASOK and other centrist parties will totally disappear because the central right uh, word of Mitsotakis, his, his, his program will totally, you know, shove them off, off, off the stage. But even if that doesn't happen, the old party like PASOK does not exist in the, in the, in the environment and in the, in the volume that used to be. We're talking about the 4%. It cannot affect things. Now, the other traditional party, of course, is the Conservative Party, Nea Demokratia. Greeks are a very enthusiastic people, like Israelis. Again, I come to the unavoidable uh, comparison. Therefore, we get enthusiastic and we get disappointed very easily. So, Nea Demokratia got extremely disappointed, the followers, and the party itself, after its double, let's say, uh, defeat during the last year of, uh, in the elections. And all of a sudden, for the last 48 hours, they're jubilant again, thinking that, you know what? Even if we say a word, Tsipras will just run out of the presidential palace and we will gain power without elections. All of a sudden, all the problems, the inherent problems of the Conservative Party have disappeared just because a younger guy with a very charismatic, again, uh, way of speech has won the internal uh, elections of Nea Demokratia. Well, Nea Demokratia, which is a totally different case in this particular instance that we're talking, in a very, however, um, moving sand environment in the political life of Greece, is different from PASOK at this stage. We're talking about sizes that are not comparable. So if they do their homework, as you said, and if they see their internal problems before they start addressing the national problems, in which they didn't do very well, admittedly, when they were in power, then they do have a chance because, as the other gentleman said, the government is bound to have frictions because of the policies it applies and because of an unavoidable mistake it makes. Every government makes mistakes, let alone a Greek government. 
This is the motto. I mean, you cannot govern if you don't make mistakes in Greece. So, um, yes, Nea Demokratia has a chance when it gets its act together. Yes, that's the old picture. The new picture, there is no new picture. The other parties that are in parliament are, is either the Communist Party, the, the real thing, however, I mean, you are saying about the relics you have in your political life, well, come and see the, the Greek uh, Communist Party, the official one. It's very respectful. I mean, I respect it a lot. It had, was the party that fought a civil war, that it, it bears the burden of that war, the victims of that war, the memories of that war, the responsibilities. It's a very respectable party, but its, it's way of talking, the way of acting, and the way of behaving, for those that are reminiscent of times of Stalin, is a very good example. I, I wish you come to Greece and go to the offices of Kukwe, the Greek Communist Party, and have a glimpse in the good old days of the past, of the 50s. Yes. For, the la for instance, the last, uh, I mean, the Communist Party is a left party. Left, by definition, is something progressive, right? I mean, at least that's what I learned when I was a communist in my youth. As Churchill has said, if you're not a communist until your 20s, you are not normal. And if you're a communist after your 20s, you're a fool. Well, I remained a fool for quite some time after my 20s. But anyway, uh, the last uh, time, I mean, it was, it was two weeks ago, we had finally um, a passing of a law in the Greek parliament that we were obliged to do anyway because of the European legislation on allowing same-sex couples of getting not married but a, a contract of, of living together, therefore having all the rights of inheritance and all the, the legal aspects of that. It's not only the, the, the physical or the social, it's the legal aspect. I mean, you live with someone for 30 years, one dies, what happens to the other? I mean, so we, you know, finally we agreed on that. We have 300 parliamentarians. 250 something voted for it. The Communist Party voted against it. Where is the progressive idea behind that? I mean, anyway, I just gave a, a sad example, but it's not the only one, unfortunately. I remain the full less than you, but. Okay. <laughs> Any other question? Yes, please. Uh, my question speaks to the relationship of uh, culture, society, and uh, politics. Uh, you mentioned in your narrative of the European Union, uh, you spoke of uh, the moment when you incorporated a large number of states, and you said, well, obviously, Malta, Cyprus, these are Western democracies, but then these other countries in the Eastern Bloc, and I was a little bit surprised by that, because I don't know if it, other than uh, being aligned with the uh, Western Bloc in the Cold War, there's a trivial way of calling these uh, countries Western, and I might be wrong about that, but I want to go with this to the, uh, the question of, of uh, Greek uh, identity as part of the West, part of Europe, which I think in the uh, tw uh, 20th century history of this country was a fraught relationship. <coughs> so speaking to the current uh, crisis, do you feel, looking at all uh, strata of Greek society, do you think there's also a crisis of identity in terms of Greeks as being uh, European or Western, or even in terms of the strength of its democracy, Democracy, given, you know, it's his fraught history with uh, 20th century history with, with democracy? I think we need another lecture to, to touch the issues that you mentioned, because they're extremely interesting and extremely pertinent. And I, I do have short answers for all them, but I would like to get together with you and have long answers because I would love that. Now, and the short answers. First of all, I did not say that the other countries that entered in 2003, 2004 did not merit to enter. Simply, I made the distinction between two countries that were in the European way of living, Malta and Cyprus, economically, financially, and socially for the past decades, not politically, I will come to that, also to Greece. And those that had come from one day to the next, from being, you know, because I have lived with these people, I know colleagues, I don't want to mention particular states, but I remember colleagues of mine, of those countries, back in the 90s, I was in Israel, that they were whispering to me when talking to me, 90, 1992. Why, I mean, why are you whispering to me, Manuel, for instance? Latin, so you can imagine which country I had in mind. North of me, but not exactly north of me. So, you know, it's a habit. 20 years I've been whispering. So those countries from one day to the other, they could not easily cope with the fact that they had to take responsible decisions as part of the European Union. 
And unfortunately, and I can, I can be very open on that, because I was serving in NATO, they didn't help, because they, simultaneously most of them came into NATO as well. They didn't help Europe a lot with their antagonism to what had remained of the Soviet Union. They were not visionary enough to see that if you see your future solely through your past and the woes you had for the last 50, 60 years, some of them even more, if we're talking about the Baltic states, then you're not going to go very far. And by not going very far, you are taking others down with you. And we all went down in that respect. The fact that we do not have a vision in Europe right now, I'm convinced, is part of what happened in the 2000s when we had the responsibility. They could not realize. We, the ones who were already inside, had the responsibility to deepen our, and integrate our union before we allowed them to come in. It would be better for them, it would be better for us. But that's history. Now, coming to the, to the identities and uh, Malta, Cyprus, and Greece that you mentioned, for very different reasons, all three countries that you mentioned had a peculiar relationship with the West and the European Union. That doesn't mean that they did not belong then, and they, even more, that they do not belong now. I don't want to go into the historical analysis of what I'm saying, but I will give you a very simple example by figures. I told you before that during the referendum, we had arrived at the point where the, the rhetoric behind the camps, the pro, let's say, uh, measure camp, and the against the measures camp, arrived at the point where the question, thank God the referendum took place and went out. Because if it lasted longer, the pre-electoral period, that would be a danger. It arrived at the point, but it was very superficial, yes to Europe or no to Europe, and you're right in that respect. But the fact that it evaporated completely right after the referendum proves the fact, if you see it in a scientific way, that there is no danger, that it was a very superficial thing that had to do with the slogans and the rhetoric and the passion of the nation, we can't deny that, during a pre-electoral campaign. In reality, nobody, except perhaps a 10, 15 percent, the Communist Party, that officially says we want to go out of the European Union, and those fanatics that I mentioned before in the Syriza party, that they were not more than 3 percent, had they been more than 3 percent, they would be in the parliament right now, because they formed a party, they did not even succeed to get into the parliament. Plus the 4 percent of the Golden Dawn, that they would like to be, you know, in the good old days of the Third Reich, which, thank God, is not there anymore. So what does it make up to? Less than 10 percent? 12 percent? I give you 15 percent. Okay, 15 percent of the Greek society wants to be in the East, wants to be either fascist or communist, or in between, I don't want to hear anyone saying that these are, two, they are the same. I told you I was a communist until my, my early 40s. So, uh, but the rest of the mainstream Greek society is anchored in the European Union for very simple reasons. That Greece is part of Europe psychologically, philosophically, apart from politically and financially, and Europe is part of Greece. These are inseparable. <coughs> they cannot separate. I think we could go on and deepen these questions, but we will have the opportunity since uh, we will have uh, this series of lectures, so please come again. And uh, I wish to uh, tell you, thank you. Very I'm very much. grateful, Professor. And we professor are Mosman, all grateful to have, the have this uh, opportunity to listen and understand better. Thank you again very much. Thank my you, honor professor and my Mosman, pleasure. To, thank you very much. Uh, Thank you all for coming. Us. And thank you. Thank you.